again, let me welcome all of you here this morning. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we especially welcome our visitors. We are grateful to have you with us, and we pray that God in His mercy will meet with you powerfully today. The last thing our nation needs in this day is just another religious service. We need gatherings of people all across this nation to meet with God and to hear from God and then to obey God. May God in His mercy grant that to us here today. If you have a cell phone, please, would you check that now and make sure that it's on buzz or quiet or... If you can bear to live without it for a little while, turn it off. I realize that for some, that is indeed self-sacrificing. But I do pray, my brethren, that uh, we will, as much as possible, be able to give our hearts and minds in an undistracted way to the Scriptures of God. Our children are with us. Those of you visiting here may see that we have our little ones in the congregation with us. We love them dearly. And we are thankful that we believe that this is where they should be and not in another place away from us. <clears throat> However, then you will notice that they are here. Occasionally, uh, they make themselves known. And they, uh, we have faithful parents here that will take them and go right through that back door into our uh, uh, fellowship room. We have a large screen television back there that we hope uh, will be very helpful to you. You can continue to follow along uh, with the message. And uh, let me encourage you, if you are here visiting with us, with little ones, uh, please uh, make use of that room. Uh, You will not disturb anybody here by your getting up and taking little ones out. You will see our own parents likely do exactly that. It's something that's just part of our weekly service. We're all used to that. And we like the benefits as they get older and are able to sit and to sing the hymns of Zion with us and to hear the Word of God, to take notes and to ask good questions about what they've heard. We are delighted. We're thankful for the faithful parents that ask them questions and that go over the sermon with them. Our brethren, we uh, are still in Matthew chapter 12. I trust you have found this a very rich chapter. We're going to be reading, beginning in verse 31 this morning, through verse 37. Now, three weeks ago, we looked at verses 31 and 32 regarding the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And I, I want to draw your attention to the fact that those verses are included in the reading this morning because they are a part of this larger portion. 31 through 37 make up one paragraph, or as sometimes referred to as a pericope. This is a segment, a portion of uh, a larger literary writing, and of course we have the greatest and the most blessed, inspired, and infallible literature in the world, the only inspired and infallible literature. So we want to take careful notice that what I will be preaching today follows on the heels of what Christ has said about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That being said, let's stand together and give our uh, attention, our hearts, attention to the Word of God. Matthew chapter 12, beginning in verse 31. What a joy it is to have God's Word before us. Brethren, I, I pray that we will give our hearts attention here. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be 
forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by his fruit. O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, bringeth forth good things. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure, bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you, that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified. By thy words, thou shalt be condemned. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his good word. We may have our morning pastoral prayer. If it is difficult for you to stand a few more minutes, please feel free to be seated. Otherwise, brethren, as we, whether we are standing or sitting, let us unite our hearts together and lift up our our hearts as one to our God as we pray. O my gracious Father in heaven, what joy it is to come into thy presence on the Lord's day. What joy should fill the soul. Lord, how I pray that in thy great mercies thou wouldst pour out thy Spirit abundantly today upon thy people. O God, I know Thy Word teacheth plainly that when Thy Spirit doth regenerate a darkened soul, Thou dost give that blessed gift of the Spirit forever to be the gift of that child of God. Yet, O Lord, we are as leaky vessels. We need Thy regular visits. We need the fillings of Thy Spirit. And we pray that Thou wouldst come to our weak and feeble and fleshy vessels today and fill us. O pour out Thy Spirit. Shed abroad the love of God in our hearts. Father, may we love Thee with a holy intensity. Move in our souls. Help us to see what we are. Oh, but O God... Don't let us see that and that alone. Father, do not show us our weakness, our sinfulness, without a glimpse of the Savior. Oh, one look at our hearts and a thousand, thousand looks to Christ. Father, please help us to be fixed upon our Savior today. How we thank Thee for giving that great and holy one to be the lover of our souls. That holy and blessed one that agreed before the foundation of the world to be our surety, to undertake for us, to be our substitute, to be our propitiation, to be our prophet, our priest, our king. How we bless Thee, O God, that Thou didst send one into this world utterly equipped, infinitely, eternally equipped to accomplish everything necessary to save our souls and to keep us to and through all eternity. Blessed be thy holy name from this time forth and forevermore. Glory to thy name, O God, for thy great, free, and glorious grace. How we thank thee that thou, O Sovereign of the heaven and earth, hast reached down into the darkness of our souls and shine the light of that precious gospel. Jesus Christ, the God-man, Jesus crucified, 
Jesus raised again. Oh, Lord, how we thank Thee for Jesus interceding for us, even at this moment, and for all Thy children as they gather throughout this world as this globe turns today on its axis. Oh, may Thy people gather. Lord, I know they're gathering in places I've never heard of. Names perhaps I could never even pronounce. And Lord, from this country and around the world, north and south, east and west, thy people are gathering throughout the day. And may they delight in thee and sing joyfully unto thee. May they pray with all their hearts unto thee. May they love thee and love one another as we pray that thou wouldst do here. Protect us, O Lord, from backbiting tongues, gossiping tongues, tongues driven by grudges and misinformation that they never vetted. O God, preserve us. The powers of darkness would divide thy people. How I pray, O Lord, that thy mighty spirit would fill each heart and unify thy people. May our hearts glimpse our Savior today in the preaching of the Word. Thou knowest our needs. Some of our brethren are sick, O Lord. We pray for the kings this morning. Lord, for Sister Donna, Brother Randy, and numerous others. O Father, there are many here that need prayer. Pray for my own dear bride, have mercy on her body. I thank thee for the mercies that thou dost continually have on her soul. And Father, I pray that for all thy dear people today, whatsoever their condition. Father, some of us need comfort. Some of us need strengthening. Some of us need a taste of joy unspeakable and full of glory. Some of us need reproof and rebuke. Lord, Thou knowest what we need, and we ask Thee to bring it. Now, Spirit of God, I pray in the name of Christ, who has forgiven us of our sins, that Thou wouldst hear us, that as a people we cry out, Lord Jesus, cleanse us. And I pray there would be nothing to hinder thee, O blessed Spirit, moving in our souls. Expose all secret sins, Lord. Grant us repentance, true repentance, real brokenness. And oh, may we find our joy in the precious blood of Christ that washes us white as snow and presents us in that beautiful, flawless robe of His righteousness before Thee. We pray it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Please be seated, brethren. After presenting Jesus Christ as the chosen, beloved, and anointed servant of God, described in Isaiah 42, verses 1 through 4, Matthew tells us that our Lord healed a blind and mute demon-possessed man. Repeating the blasphemy they had spoken before, the Pharisees attributed the power by which Jesus worked this great miracle to Beelzebub, another term for Satan. Jesus then corrected their illogical thinking and declared, If I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. He then asked them, How can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods except he first 
bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. Well, this is precisely what Christ was doing. That the very miracle of casting out the devil and causing the blind to see and the mute to speak was Jesus, the stronger one, who had bound the wicked strong man and plundered his house. And as I said before, the very fact that we are gathering and the very fact that God's people are gathering, His true people, His regenerate people, across this globe is proof that Christ, the stronger Christ, the conquering King, plunders the strong man's house at will because He will and only because He will. Now, Jesus was obviously affirming that He had bound that strong man, Satan, that He was plundering and would continue to plunder His house. Praise the Lord. In other words, contrary to the Pharisees' accusation, Jesus implied that He worked His miracles in the power of God's Spirit which demonstrated the presence of God's kingdom. And because of this, our Savior made a solemn proclamation. All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And that is in this world and the world to come. The Pharisees had crossed that dreadful line. And that is what makes this portion of Matthew's Gospel so important. The divide between the dead religion of the Jews and the living Christ and the kingdom of God is now clear and irreparable. This does not mean that the Lord will not go on plundering the strong man's house. But it does mean that the empty religion of the Pharisees has now crossed the line into destruction. And Christ will press on with His glorious kingdom work until He reaches the cross, dying in the place of His people and rising again to eternal glory. And that brings us to our text. In it, Christ has exposed and denounce, or in, the, in this text, Christ exposes and denounces the Pharisees' true spiritual condition. So our message is entitled, Your Words Reveal Your Heart. Your Words Reveal Your Heart. May our loving and gracious Heavenly Father, teach us His truths powerfully and convincingly as we take up the inspired text. Now, our first thought is this. Jesus exposed the Pharisees as evil-hearted vipers that could not speak good things. We find this in verses 33 and 34. Jesus first challenged the Pharisees' thinking with a proverb. Verse 33. Our blessed Savior said, Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. But the tree is known by His fruit. The point of Christ's statement is clear. We can know 
that a tree is good or rotten by the fruit that it brings forth. But why did Jesus say it this way? The answer seems to be this. Throughout this chapter, Jesus has pointedly corrected the Pharisees' erroneous and illogical thinking with common sense. Early on, he corrected them with the Scriptures. Now he's just dealing with their bad thinking. And he does the same thing here, that same kind of thing. He stated an obvious fact in the form of a proverb to make them come to a conclusion. Make the tree good. Well, is that a a commandment? What's he saying? How would we do that if it were a command? Either make the tree good and and its fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and its fruit corrupt. Well, quite obviously, he's not commanding us to make corrupt trees. What does he mean? Well, this may have been a well-known proverb in Jesus' day, or it might have been one of his own creation. We don't know. But he's clearly speaking in a proverbial way. But, however we understand this, by expressing it in this way, Jesus meant something like this. We, we say to people, well, give him an inch and he'll take a mile. We're not commanding someone to give them an inch, even though that's coming in an imperative way. And that's the way we deliver some Proverbs. It's the way the language works. Christ is not commanding us or the Pharisees, so to speak, to dig and dung and water trees, either to make them good or make them bad. He is speaking proverbially to them about Him. He He means something like this. You Pharisees have seen the miracles I've done, which are obviously good fruit. The blind see, that's a good thing. The mute speak. Devils are cast out. You cannot deny that all these things are good. Nevertheless, you attribute that good fruit to Satan. By this, you did declare that I am an evil tree. Now, you're going to have to decide something. What does the fruit tell you? What does the fruit tell you? Either consider me good and my fruit good, make the tree good and its fruit, Or consider me bad and my fruit bad. But you can't have it both ways. Which one is it? Am I a good tree with good fruit? Or a bad tree with bad fruit? What does the fruit tell you? Well then... Jesus revealed why it was impossible for the Pharisees to speak good things. He said boldly, O generation of vipers! How can ye, being evil, speak good things? Jesus had no problem Confronting people with their character, which is a tragedy today. People in what I might call 
uh, the loose fitting, badly tailored evangelical uh, Christianism that floats around out there today is that if you say something bad or negative to or about something, you're not being Christian. Brethren, there's no more Christian than Christ. Now, this does not mean that we're to spend all of our time speaking in negative ways. What I'm saying is that there is a time, there is a place for evaluating and then speaking according to truth. And this is what the Lord Jesus is doing. Let's remember, who is he speaking to? The religious elite, the leaders of the Jewish nation spiritually. Generation of vipers. John the Baptist had said to the Pharisees and Sadducees when they showed up at his baptism, apparently not to be baptized, O oh, generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Remember, the coming of Jesus was great news, the best news, and the worst of news. Great news for those who repent and embraced Him as Messiah. The same thing today. But the worst news for those who refuse Him because God has set before this world a way of pardon, a way of everlasting life. His coming was blessing and cursing. It was heaven and hell. Jesus now repeats the very same thing that John said, you generation of vipers. They'd heard it before. Now they hear it from the lips of Christ. They didn't believe John, as the gospel will eventually show us. And they don't believe Christ. Now, Jesus did not use the word generation in the way that we commonly, commonly do today. That is, all of the people born and living at about the same time. Our generation. That's not the way he's using it. This was not a general statement. It was a direct and pointed statement to the Pharisees. And <clears throat> Jesus meant... That which has been born of a living creature, offspring, children. You offspring of poisonous snakes. That's what Jesus is saying. Jesus, the chosen, beloved, and anointed, Servant of God described the religious leaders of his day as children of poisonous serpents. Now, their distortions and their additions to God's word were poisonous to God's people, but more importantly, they had spewed their poisonous lies about the sinless. Holy Son of God, in spite of His astonishing displays of divine power. This fellow doth not cast out devils. Well, they understood He cast them out. Good fruit. But by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils, the bad three. That's why Christ addressed them with his proverb. By calling the Pharisees the offspring of poisonous snakes, he was, uh, Jesus was plainly describing their character and linking them to Satan. In the Gospel of John, he says it plainly. You are of your father, 
the devil. Christ's works showed him to be a good tree. Their words showed them to be corrupt, rotten trees. Christ's penetrating question pointed to a devastating conclusion. How can ye, how can ye, being evil? Notice, he doesn't say, well, you know, we all have bad days. Ah, we all mess up once in a while. He said, how can you, being evil, speak good things? Jesus' proclamation is clear, stunning, dreadful. Being evil described what the Pharisees were in their hearts and their characters. They weren't wicked because they did wicked things. And so many people today, professing Christians, think in these terms. Wicked things make us sinners. No. We do wicked things because we are sinners. It's what we are. Being evil. Those are awful words, brethren. This is why Christ went on to say, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Abundance here means fullness, overflow. Something filled up. What fills up a person's heart flows out at the mouth. This is what Jesus is saying. I mean, again, another delusion we live with is, oh, I know he says and does terrible things, but he's really good at heart. Now, I would understand non-Christians saying that. It is truly astonishing to me that anybody that has read the Bible carefully just a few times could ever say that. No, they say foul things and they do wicked things because their hearts are full of wickedness. It isn't just a bad day. It just happened to be the opportunity to express what filled the heart. And we're all guilty. What overflows in the heart pours out of our lips. And in this, our Savior completely turned the tables on the Pharisees. His fruit, His words and miracles, revealed that He was good. Their fruit, their words, of blasphemy and their plot to kill him re- revealed that they were corrupt. Because their hearts were rotten, corrupt, evil, as every lost person is. They could not speak good things, especially about him. Rather, what filled their heart to overflowing was demonic envy, hatred, murder. They were rotten to the core, and it spewed as pious poison from their lips. This fellow, right folks, be careful. This fellow doesn't do this, but by Satan. They believed they were doing God's work. When in fact they were children of the devil. Brethren, these kinds of passages make me tremble. 
I know the weakness, the foulness, the history of this sinful vessel. I don't want to swap one life of darkness for a life of religious darkness. And in America, it's on every corner. This is indeed sobering, as many of the last paragraphs in uh, the last uh, three chapters have been. Well, brethren, it doesn't stop here. The great physician was not finished with his profound diagnosis of the corrupt trees before him. Our second major heading is that Jesus contrasted good and evil hearts. He takes this idea and makes it more specific. Once again, Christ gave a very simple but weighty lesson. Jesus takes the truth that he had spoken in proverbial form in verse 33, and now he makes it crystal clear. A good heart brings forth good things. Jesus said, a good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. Now, our Savior here described the human heart as a treasury or as a treasure chest out of which a person brings forth good or evil things. The person who has a good heart, the person who has a good treasury, a heart transformed by the grace of God, brings forth good words and good works from that treasure chest. His or her heart is a treasury for gracious, biblical, and even heavenly things. Who had spoken nothing but good things and worked nothing but good works since His appearance in Israel? Jesus. Nothing but. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. But an evil heart brings forth evil things. Jesus turned the coin over to the other side. This is a two-sided coin. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. Now, while Jesus is speaking in what we would think are general terms, remember that he's addressing the Pharisees. What has come out of their heart about associating him with Satan shows that when they go into that secret place where the treasure chest is and they scoop up an armful of things to bring out, they are ugly and hideous and foul and evil. When the man born of God's Spirit goes into that place where his treasury is, and he, he scoops up and brings out things. He brings out beautiful things and good things and edifying things. This is the picture Jesus is painting. Now, they know that after he healed a man on the Sabbath, they left and plotted to kill him. So he's speaking very clearly to them. Don't, don't read the generality, the generalness of what Christ is saying and miss the context. They reached down into their treasury and brought up the murder of the Son of God. Jesus was obviously applying this to the Pharisees. Had they repented of their sins? No. Had they believed on Christ as Messiah? 
No. Had they proclaimed His mighty words and works to be in the power of the kingdom of God? No. They accused Him of being in league with the devil. And they reached down into their treasury. All they could bring up was corrupt and rotten fruit. Because their hearts were rotten. Now, you see, that's the way religion works. You can paste religion on the outside. You can do some things that other people do. If you're pretty sharp, you can listen to Christian lingo and pick up that tongue. And you can say, oh, yes, let's pray for our brother and sister. Pray that God will give them traveling mercies. Whatever traveling mercy is. Now, we can say all kinds of things that people say in church. And we can learn a few Bible verses. But there's a tattletale in our lives. And it's our tongue. That ultimately says what's flowing out, what's overflowed, what that heart is full of. If there's a a hot cup of coffee sitting on the table, uh, filled to the brim, and you bump it with your elbow, orange juice doesn't flow out. Your favorite beverage or water, it's what's in the cup comes out. And that's exactly what Jesus is telling them. And He's telling us the same. They accused His miracles of being Satan's work. This came willingly. It came purposefully. And it came directly from their evil treasury. From their hearts. So that brings us to our third major point. Jesus confirmed that human beings will be justified or condemned by their words in the day of judgment. I've wondered occasionally why Jesus would speak in general terms when indeed he was, he was making something very specific to uh, a contemporary hearer. But I've begun to realize that there are multiple answers to that. And one of them is for those of us that are reading a hundred years later, uh, a thousand years later, two thousand years later, for us to realize that while in its context it applied directly to them, it also has a general application to us. And we have that here in verses 36 and 37. We will according to Christ, give account for our words in the day of judgment. God's precious Son declared, but I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Now again, brethren, let me me just put a footnote here. Some of you may have had a difficult week, a very weighty week. Perhaps you've had uh, troubling things to have to wade through. And you think, well, you know, I've come on the Lord's Day here. And here's another one of these, I mean, 18-wheeler kind of sermons where it just like rolls over you. Brethren, I didn't write this book. I'm taking it verse by verse and telling you what it is saying and meaning. Christianity is heavier than modern Christians want to believe. We want froth. Froth and, hey, happy Christian parties. Well, there's a time for joy and joy unspeakable. I like happiness. I like to laugh. But the truth sobers us up because it's a sin-cursed earth. It not only fills our heart with joy and encouragement and strength and comfort. It does all those things. But as we work through here, we have to see how Jesus publicly ministered. 
And here he is giving us yet a very heavy, a very weighty, and a most profound declaration. Whenever Jesus says, I say unto you, this is not just a little bit of literary passing the time. But here's how I'll make the story run. Now, brethren, we, every word of God is pure. And when we see something like that, we need to realize Jesus was speaking authoritatively as God with us. God with us. God with human beings. He is the Christ, the anointed one of God. He is speaking as the greatest prophet that ever graced this world with his presence and with his words. He is the God-man, fully God, fully man. My brethren, Whenever Jesus said, I say unto you, human beings were hearing God's revelation, pure and empowered by God's Spirit directly from God Himself. I say unto you, we need to sit down, sit up, and say, Lord, help me to understand what you are saying. This was a heavenly word of a heavenly kingdom. And what did Jesus say here? Every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. The word idle means exactly that. Having nothing to do. Unemployed. Therefore, it comes to mean Something that's unproductive doesn't get the job done. And therefore, worthless, useless. Some even believe it means careless or without thought. But I leave you to study that out. In this context, it seems to mean fairly clearly, words that serve no good purpose. Now, it's not unusual when believers, especially those of us who have sensitive consciences, read passages like this, and the first thing that we do is we think, well, okay, that's, that's the end of anything amusing, that's the end of saying anything funny, that's the end of saying... Uh, the sky is blue today. That's, that's the end. Of, everything all of a sudden becomes insignificant. Now, let me say this. If we would sit and think, we would, we would realize how many of our words are useless. They serve no good purpose. It doesn't mean we cannot encourage one another. It doesn't mean we cannot laugh. It doesn't mean that there are not times to say in a proper context and with words that might be useful to say things that are amusing or that are day-to-day things. How are things going with your homeschooling? Oh, boy, the last month was really tough. But we've had some breakthroughs. That's, that's not useless talk. That's part of the kind of thing that God's people live through and live with and bear one another's burdens through. But we can also reflect our culture and spend a lot of time showing everybody how witty we are and how clever we are and how funny we are. And very often, they're words entirely to no purpose. Other than, look at me. Yeah, I'm cute. I'm funny. I'm hilarious. Real wit up here. Parents, are you teaching your children that? <clears throat> Now, we want to think here, brethren, and we want to see what our Master is telling us.
To give account means to explain why things were said. Our sovereign Lord then is saying something to this effect. I assure you, as Messiah the Prince, the beloved Son of God, when the day of judgment arrives, all people will explain to God why they spoke every word that they should not have spoken. That's sobering. See, there's several questions that were we all to ask each other on, on a regular basis. First of all, we wouldn't like seeing each other coming. It would be things like, hey, brother, hey, sister, it's so good to see you today. I've been praying for you. How's your time in the Word? Uh, um, um, uh, well, you know, it could be better. That, of course, is not the answer to the question. How's your prayer life? Hmm, that's another one. Especially if it follows the first one. But suppose we were to tag onto that, and throughout this week, have you thought about the things you've said because you're going to give account to them before God? We'd want to bring that discussion to an end pretty quickly, wouldn't we? Isn't that right? We'd say, what a negative person. But what is Jesus saying to us? You've said some things that you're going to need to do some explaining for. And this will always come back to the problem, won't it? The problem is not the words themselves. It's the heart. What was going on in your heart that you said that? That you thought you needed to say that? You were in that situation and you just spoke about somebody and completely reduced them to ashes in the minds of those people when maybe you were passing on something that you didn't understand properly. Oh, brethren, are we using words to good purpose? Again, these are the kind of things that can make us so paranoid we want to lock ourselves in the room and never say anything to anybody. That isn't what Jesus is saying. He's talking about words to no good purpose. We can actually encourage and edify our brothers and sisters sometimes with the smallest of small talk. Properly understood. Properly shared. We're not saying that everybody's got to sit down and immediately launch into a really profound discussion of infralapsarianism versus superlapsarianism. We're not saying that. We're not saying that we immediately have to sit down and take on all the theological controversies of the day. One, you don't have a mind for all of them. Two, there's too many of them. There's just too many. Brethren, we're to use our tongues to beautify, to glorify, to encourage, to build up. There's so many ways we can use our tongues for good. That's what God always does. God always uses His tongue in a right, holy, and perfect way. And amazingly, by faith in Christ, we're in union with the living God. You can control that little member and use it for good. For many of us, it's the, the struggle of life. Well, Jesus doesn't finish yet again. Jesus then made an, another astonishing announcement. We will be justified or condemned by our words. Verse 37. From the tongue that never spoke a sinful syllable came this remarkable utterance. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. I remember as a young Christian reading this and being deeply confused and really afraid. I said, man, if this is all hanging on my mouth, it's over for me. In this saying, Jesus changes from the plural you in verse 36 
to the singular thy and thou in verse 37. And so with this, once again, it seems that Jesus is speaking in a proverbial way. And we can almost hear it in those words. With your, with your words, you will be justified. With your words, you will be condemned. That sounds just exactly like the kind of thing that we hear in the, the book of Proverbs or in proverbial speaking throughout the ancient world. Whether that was a saying that they all knew or whether that was something that simply came from infinite wisdom and a holy heart it doesn't change the point. This is perhaps as weighty, if not weightier, than the previous verse. But this, this language intensifies the warning. He's not only warning the Pharisees. And why? Because they had associated Him, the holy, pure, and righteous Son of God, with Satan. But the fact that the, the overall truth of that trickles down to us today. Those Pharisees were going to stand before God and their words would say something about the character of their heart. And God would make a pronouncement about them because of that. The scene is the awesome courtroom of God. The courtroom of God. I've seen big, strapping, strong, sometimes murderous men, violent men, sit in the presence of a judge and break down and weep because they knew they were sitting before the one who would pronounce the sentence upon them. Now, there are those that come in, and they're arrogant and prideful, and they, they act like, eh, no big deal. Say what you're going to say. But I have seen people throughout the years I have been in trial, breaking down before the judge. Let me tell you what, folks. When you stand before Almighty God, everyone will be quiet. He will make His solemn pronouncements and there will be no plea bargaining. None whatsoever. There will be no changes. Once He's pronounced, it's finished. And by the way, how astonishing for us to learn that it will be Jesus Christ on that throne. Those Pharisees will stand before that Christ that they said was working with Satan only to discover that they had been Satan's fools all of their lives. That's sober. That's sober. Well, brethren, <clears throat> perhaps few passages in the Gospels are more troubling, especially to sensitive believers, than this and others like it. This is a heart-searching thought. The tragedy is we'll sit here and some of us will kind of come under conviction and 15 minutes after we're gone, we're back to talking just the way we were. Not a single change made and not another thought about it the rest of the day. Oh, that's dangerous. If you're nodding off, you want to be awake for the rest of this. This is serious. But then let me say to you, this is a crucial matter. Now, I do want to say this. <clears throat> our words reveal our hearts, and they are evidence of our spiritual condition. Along with this, the Word of God is very clear. Sinners are justified by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. Jesus is not saying that your words save you or don't save you in the sense of meritoriousness. 
regenerate souls believe with all their hearts in faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ. So what then does Jesus mean when he says, By thy words thou wilt be justified? It means that in that day our words will have given outward evidence of our inward character. Justified here means to be shown to be righteous. Shown to be righteous. In other words, weak and feeble as we may be, our words throughout the course of our lives as Christians will ultimately reflect a new heart, a believing heart, a heart that believes on the Lord Jesus Christ alone, which is exactly what the Pharisees were not doing. And for all of their religious talk, they would be exposed as evil. Now, it is true, brethren, when Jesus Christ's blood was shed upon Calvary, as it flowed from His head, His hands, and His feet, He cleansed us from all our sins, including our sins of the tongue. So keep in mind what is happening here. Jesus is saying, ultimately, one of the evidences that we are converted will be the words we have spoken in this life. And it might be those words that will prove us to have been false worldlings, religionists. The words of the believer will ultimately reveal that they were righteous. Why? Because they professed Christ and they walked with Christ. And as they did that, praying, reading the Word of God, hearing the Word preached, and applying it to their lives and obeying it, that their words will begin to grow and begin to mature in ways that encourage and strengthen God's people. They will show forth the praises of our God. They will encourage and build up God's people. Yes, we can have moments where we sin, but what will those that are regenerate do? They will repent. They will repent. They will turn to Christ. And the Lord will continue working on that little member, making it more like His. Praise the Lord. I long for that day, brethren. I look for that day when everything that comes through this mouth gate exalts Him and is beautiful to His people. The words of the wicked will be evidence of their wickedness and of their damnation. Oh, why Solomon said, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Even though the Pharisees were religious leaders and highly respected as holy, their words ultimately proved that they were the children of Satan, not the children of Christ. And may we learn from this very sober portion of Matthew's Gospel. This is connected, my dear brethren, to the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. They had blasphemed the Spirit by saying that Christ did His work by Satan. Instead of falling on the ground before Him, kissing His feet and saying, Blessed Messiah, we repent of our sin and trust Thee. Well, let's make a few applications before we close. Number one, our Savior teaches us that religious leaders are not always what they appear to be. That's one of the underlying truths in this text. The Pharisees read and memorized Scripture probably far more than any of us in this congregation ever have or ever will. 
They were encyclopedic in their understanding and application of God's law and of many Jewish theological writings that governed their interpretation. They prayed in public with long prayers and sounded a trumpet in the synagogues and in the streets. And although they were respected as holy men, in their heart of hearts, they were just murderous religionists. And their words proved it. That's what this is all about. This is what Christ is saying. Their words revealed their hearts. It showed what they really were. In our own day, we have many celebrity preachers who people nearly fall over to get their autograph like they were rock stars. We have celebrity preachers who finally prove their hypocrisy by their actions and by their words and doctrine as well. And some of us are just swept up in the stream. We don't listen carefully. We don't become Berean and examine the Scriptures to see if what we're hearing is from children of the serpent or from Christ. Some are no more than false teachers that Jesus warned us of. And may we too examine our own hearts by this. Are we what we appear to be? I've been a pastor for a while now. God's people can look one way in the pews, and when they're standing around talking afterwards, we get in my office and I get different people. Wouldn't be honest to sit down and talk with another brother or sister about some of the things they're wrestling with for anything on the planet. Got to keep up that, hey, you know, our family's okay. We're all right. We do this, we do this, and we do this. We're okay. Until they have to go get help. But we can sure appear to be something that indeed we are not. And ultimately our words will show it. Our lives may say, conservative, Bible believers, evangelical. But how about our words at home? Husbands, how about your words at home? Do you edify your wife? Do you thank your wife? Do you praise your wife? Do you encourage your wife? Do you build her up? In the faith, do you lead your wives in paths of righteousness? Or is that all just part of the fad this group's in? Wives, how do you talk to your husband? How do you respond to the God-appointed head in your home? Now, you know he's faulty. You know he's faulty. And so are you. Do your lips express submission? Do your do your lips encourage? Or do you just constantly know how to tell what's wrong? Is there anything that would encourage your husband to go on and be a godly man? Or have you just found a way to slip in the knife or beat him with the Word of God? Parents, how do you talk to your children? Do you edify? Do you encourage? Do you strengthen? Do you build up? Yes, there's time for reproof for husbands and wives, for parents and children. Absolutely. We reprove one another. But is that all to it? Some people, that's, that's, it seems like that's the only word they know regarding their tongue as a Christian. Reprove, hi. Rebuke, hello. Reprove, reprove. Brethren, there's a holy balance. Children, how do you speak to your parents? How do you speak to your parents? 
You think it's cool to shoot your mouth off and put them in their place? You like to tell them why you don't want to do what they want you to do? That's very dangerous. The fifth commandment still stands. Honor thy father and thy mother. Still stands. Brethren, I don't believe there's a soul here beginning behind the pulpit that will win the award for silver tongue of knowledge and encouragement as God commands. But we can do better. Can we not? We can grow. We can mature. But you see, lying at the heart of that is lying uh, at the heart of Christ's message to begin with. Repent. When you use that mouth in a sinful way, repent. Repent. One of the hardest things for a parent to do sometimes is sit down with the children and say, you know how Daddy spoke to you last week? You know how Daddy spoke to Mama? Uh, you know, when, when she dropped the glass and broke it or didn't have dinner on time when I came in? You know how, how Daddy sounded? That was sinful, children. And I've asked the Lord to forgive me. I've asked your Mama to forgive me. Will you forgive me? that ever go on in your house? Is there anything like this? This is important. What are you teaching your children? Well, when you sin, you just clam up and kind of pretend it didn't happen. We've been given tongues, and they can be fountains of blessing. You can encourage. You can build up. You can strengthen. You can, if you're born of God's Spirit. Whether it be Religionists, as in Christ's day, or folks in the homeschool movement. Our words betray us. We might just be something we don't appear to be. And that's not a good place to be. We need to be honest. We need to be gracious. We need to speak as those who have been saved from our tongues. Secondly, our Savior teaches us that we must, by His example in the Scriptures, evaluate if we are good or corrupt or bad trees. The sacred text that we've considered is an extension of what Jesus taught on the Sermon on the Mount. The false prophets, Jesus said, Ye shall know them. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. This is something that lies at the heart of Jesus' teaching. Good and bad trees. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Brother, do we not understand that the passage that we've read and considered this morning is holy commentary on that teaching? Throughout the New Testament, there are many tests of life in Christ Jesus. But the test that Jesus sets before us in this text is truly heart-searching. It's penetrating. And fundamental. There have been times when I've had to sit down and counsel someone. And in marital counseling, I told the Lord years ago, Lord, I do not want to do marital counseling. Well, when he puts you in the pastorate, you end up with it. You can't sidestep it. You say, well, you know, I'll deal with stuff like lying and stealing, but you don't want to deal with that marriage stuff. We have to do it. But I can't sit there and hear what goes back and forth, which sometimes is so tragically ugly. I can't sit there and hear what goes back and forth without almost feeling myself sitting in front of a mirror and realizing how sinful I've been in my life. And I'm pierced to the soul about things that I have said or done to my own beloved. I mean, it is not unusual for me to come back from doing marital counseling and just pleading with my wife to forgive me again. Well, how about with the tongue? That's what Jesus is doing here today. 
He's let us see something that's going back and forth. And there should be something about that that creeps down into our hearts and says, and how about you? How about your tongue? How's it going with your tongue? Are you building up? Are you tearing down? Is all you can do criticize? Or are you one of those La La Land people that's always like, everything's just great, and it's not? Yeah? <laughs> yeah, there are some. There are. But brethren, are we good or bad trees? We have to, we have to determine, and one of the ways we determine that is our tongues. What's, because they're directly connected to our hearts. When our hearts get bumped, what's in there spills out. There is no middle ground. There is no neutrality. Where you sit right now, my friend, you are right now a good tree or a bad tree. One of the clearest evidences of your state is your tongue. Because your words reveal your heart. Two things. Modesty and our words say more about our hearts than almost anything else. Because that's what we put on parade before other people. That's the fact. We can hide a lot of other stuff, but we can't hide the way we dress. We can hide a lot of other things, but we usually can't hide our tongues. Now, some people get really good at, oh, hi, brother. How are you? Praise the Lord. You know, after they've just completely chewed their his, his wife or his spouse out or his children and just, it's just fine. And, but if you're around them long enough, sooner or later, what's in there will come out. Those little grudges. Somebody comes up in a conversation, and somehow you just can't help but say, Oh, well, did you know? Or we ought to pray for brother or sister so-and-so because you know what she's doing behind her husband's back. I said, This is gossip. It's amazing how many prayer meetings turn into just gossip pits. Let's pray for the pastor because he said he was going to do something for me. He didn't do it. Brethren, your tongue is telling on you every day. I love the sovereign God, but I am so worried. Man, ah, stressed out. Everything. I'm stressed. This is hard, hard. Life is hard. Man, it's tearing me up. What do you want? Sweetheart? Yeah, I mean, do we get this? Your heart's telling on you. All the time. Because your tongue is speaking what's in it. Well, here's our last thought. We need to stop. But our Savior teaches us that nothing reveals the spiritual condition of our hearts as our words do. Nothing, nothing, nothing. All of these, I trust you see, are connected. These are all connected. The sins of our tongues do not escape God's perfect, unobstructed hearing. He hears it all. I can miss part of what someone's saying and get something entirely out of the conversation that we never discussed. It doesn't happen that way with God. He hears every bit of it. My dear brethren, His penetrating gaze always goes to the fountain of our tongues, our hearts. He doesn't see as men see. And the Scriptures are full of warning and instruction about our tongues. We don't have time to cover that this morning. I will not repeat the length of my message from last week. Let me simply quote James, who says, If any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. He's saying, if you can control that little member, you can control the rest of it. That's an amazing thing. And most of us who have attempted to control this thing understand the reality of what James is saying. The tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and is set on fire of hell. 
But we could go into a long series just on the tongue, couldn't we? The Scriptures talk so much about the tongue. If I were to say, well, you know, we're going to have a, a message on homosexuality today, there would be people who would say, yeah, I mean, just tell us how wrong that is. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm, going to, I'm going to preach to you about abortion. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a good Bible thumper. Yeah, abortion, and they're killing those babies. And boy, we can get fired up about that. If I said, today I'm starting a series on the tongue, it would get quiet. Because it's a sin that we don't make much of. We don't think it's very important. And there's more in here about the tongue than the other two things I mentioned. It's become a respectable sin, as Jerry Bridges said. So, brethren, let me close by saying, Jesus Christ died upon Calvary's cross to save us from our sins, which includes the massive, the massive sins of our tongue. There's so many ways that we can sin with our tongue. It is just absolutely remarkable. But Christ wants us to know that's a part of the day of judgment. That's why we need a Savior. That's why we need a great and glorious God who gave His Son to wash away our gossip, to wash away our lies, to wash away our hateful, angry speech, to wash away the damage we've done with our tongue. They ultimately talk about our tongue. They ultimately talk about our heart. Let us look to Christ and let us grow in the use of our tongues. Brethren, some of you are such good encouragers. I like to just be around you, especially after a difficult week. Some of you want to talk about the things of the Lord. Some of you want to find out how can I this? Can I help you? Can I? I mean, we can use our tongues in so many good ways. Are we doing that? By grace in Christ, we can. Our tongues reveal our hearts. Amen. Father, the Pharisees stood on this planet and said some things that no doubt made complete sense to them. And they thought that their desire to destroy Christ was God-honoring. How wrong can human beings possibly be? Though, Father, I pray that it is not so with one of us here, that we're just religious worldlings, with a few words that are right, and spending most of our time using our tongues the wrong way. Oh, Father, please forgive us of our many sins of the tongue, And by thy grace and by thy love, may we speak healing and encouragement and building up of the faith to our brothers and sisters. We pray at all that Christ would be exalted. Amen. Well, brethren, if you would please stand with me, we will close. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do His will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's go in the name of the Lord Jesus.